lot of this was uh, stuff that we kind of already know, already knew, just for doing it in the Windows environment. But we're going to talk about some new kind of exploitation vectors that Windows provides us from now on that are actually more useful than overriding the return address. Um, the main one you see in um, Windows Stack Overflows, pretty much the facto one, is structured exception handlers, or just exception handlers. And these are essentially just function pointers that exist on the stack that get executed when something bad happens, when an exception happens. So when you see like a try catch statement, et cetera, a lot of times it's using these uh, Windows exception handlers to um, implement all this by just putting these function pointers on the stack. And um, the process knows where all these exception handlers are in the stack because the tab points in them, the bread execution block, which is that thing, process meta information, that is uh, referenced by the FS register. So for instance, if you were to do thing tab in here, you can see the it says exception list at 1, 2, FFB0. And that's just what the process is keeping track of. OK, this is where all my exception handler function pointers are happening. And whenever a process encounters an exception, the uh, window is kind of like process shepherd is going to say, all right, this process just had an exception. Let's uh, parse through its exception list, which is a, a singularly linked list, and call these functions so that the process can potentially um, either recover from the exception or die gracefully at least. Uh, even without these try catch statements, though, these exception handlers still exist on the stack. Windows puts the default ones there that are still on the stack, even if you're not using this try catch paradigm, try except paradigm in C++. So they're pretty much always there because uh, Windows puts them there to try to make their processes more resilient or something like that. So yeah, in this case, you know, if you're doing it the legit way, this would cause an exception. and um, Trying to send dead beef equal to 41414 on a dead beef isn't real. And then it would cause call my exception handler. And in a real application, this would either like log an error event and try to continue, or log an error and quit, or somehow try to recover from what just happened. So um, there are some handy plugins that Windybug provides for examining these things. And you can, uh, the bang x chain command will tell you what the current exception handler list is. But note that this address, so x chain is starting at 1, 2, FFB0. It's really just getting from the uh, thread execution block. And so when we're developing exploits, it's usually more handy to look at this, or more useful to look at this stuff manually than by using these plugins, because these plugins are assuming the data is like legit and sanitized, and when we're doing an exploit, usually end up corrupting all this stuff, and so the plugins are just going to kind of bark and die because the data is going to be messed up. Whereas if we look at everything manually, we can kind of see what's going on instead of the plugin is dying. So if I do dd one two ffd zero. What we see here is uh, basically a single linked list where the first four bytes of the exception handler are the pointer to the next exception handler. So this is basically a, a 230, a 2D word structure. The first uh, four bytes are the next pointer. And the, um, the last four bytes are the actual function pointer to be executed when the exception occurs. And then let's see, 1, 2, F, F, E, 0 is right here. F, 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 F just signifies this is the end of the linked list. So there is no next linked list. And then the last, the very last function pointer. So what we're going to do, the important thing to note here is that these exception handlers are above the stack, kind of like above the, uh, the stack frame of the currently executing function. So for overriding a buffer, we 
you can uh, corrupt these things. And if an exception occur if an exception occurs, a function pointer will be called that is controlled by the attacker. So it's another way for us to gain control of the IP. Corey, is there a data structure for the chain? A data structure for the what? Exposed. The chain, the except, uh, structure the exception handler chain, you can look at, like, use in the wind debug. Like, yeah. if there's a chain using some structure, right? They're yeah. going to point to next to previous. So, you can use the Bang XChain um, plugin to automatically iterate over that linked list. And you're asking if there's like a. Uh, she a was asking if there's a structure that you can use DT with. Yeah, exactly. Um, there is, but I don't know the name of the structure. But there really isn't. Um, there's no need to since it's not a complicated structure. It's just an eight byte structure, an X pointer, and then a function pointer. So. I've never used it just because it's such a simple structure that, you know, I don't really think there's a need to. So, why this is useful is that when we corrupt a process, it's likely that we'll somehow cause an exception. So, if we're writing, overwriting all these local variables, before we get to the, um, the return address or the function pointer or whatever it is we're trying to overwrite to gain control of EIP, if one of those local variables that we overwrote, overwrote was like a um, was like a um, pointer, if we just corrected that pointer and see reference before the return address is used, then it's going to cause an exception, all right? And that exception could cause the program to crash before we gain control of EIP. However, if we have um, overwritten one of those exception handlers, when the exception occurs, before the process dies, it's going to call that function pointer and we'll be able to execute our shell code. So we don't have to worry about the process surviving because it's okay if the uh, exception is generated because then we'll just gain control of EIP. Okay, so everyone sort of follow the logic of why that is um, going to be more useful than the return address. So, for example, in this case, if we overflow buff right here, we're going to overwrite this uh, file pointer. And let's assume we're trying to overwrite the return address, okay? We've like corrupted the return address. We've overwritten everything with 4141s four four till we get to the return address, which we've pointed at our shell code in buffer or something like that. When it goes to F close FP, then it's going to crash because FP now points at dead B for 414141. Now, presumably, we could um, architect our overflow so that all these local variables we overwrite are replaced with legitimate values. But um, this can be hard. There can be a lot of local variables, and you might not know what they're supposed to be. They're pointing at the heap or something like that. Um, and replacing those local variables, they might have bad bytes in them, like null bytes or something like that, if we're in an ASCII string buffer workflow. So it's just hard to reproduce what all these local variables should be pointing at. So instead, what we'll do is we'll overwrite the return address, save frame pointer, we'll overwrite those exception handlers, and then we'll just we could let the program keep going, and then it would crash, and then we'll gain control of the EIP. But usually what you see in um, Windows exploits is that, yeah, OK, you overwrite the exception handle and all these local variables or turn address, then you just keep writing and writing and writing and write so much data. We fall off the end of the stack. The process generates an exception, and then, bam, our overwritten exception handler kicks in, and we've gained control of the EIP. Now, what's really useful about this is that by default, Windows installs this GS protection, these stack canaries on your stack frame for anything that has an ASCII buffer like this. And it's basically a canary randomized value in between your local variables and the return address. So that if you smash the stack, you're going to corrupt that canary. 
And then before the function returns, it checks that that canary is still intact. And if it's not, it's not going to return. It's just going to kill the process with like a security violation. However, if we do it this way and we overwrite the exception handlers and then generate an exception, either by making this generate an exception or by writing so much data would fall into the stack, the canaries will never be checked. We'll gain control of EIP and the Windows exception handler code never bothers to check that the canary or the stack is uh, intact before it starts calling those exception handler function pointers. So that's a few reasons why these uh, exception handlers are kind of the prime target as opposed to return addresses in the Windows stack overflow world. So basically, this is going to automatically allow us to bypass stack canaries and GM protection at tomorrow. Just one reason about why these things are more useful than return addresses. Okay, so in this case, um, I'm just trying to exploit this program and just kind of like going through slides and describing what was just happening while I was trying to overwrite the return address. I overwrite the return address. Everything is going good, and then bam, access violation, and that's just because uh, when it's trying to do this F close call way up in the top left corner, FP has been corrupted, so it's crashing on the call to F close. But if at this point we had overridden the exception handler list, our, we would have gained control of the IP because we would have overridden that function. Okay. So what I'm talking about here, let me show you guys actually, is um, stored in project SDH overflow. So this is just the source code that I was showing you. So if I was trying to exploit this <coughs> like before, Okay, I want to show you guys what happens and why this is going to work. Corey, can you increase the size again? Yeah, sorry. I'll try to remember you guys. Better? I thought you said you had found like some way to save the same preferences across different file names of executables that you open up. Yeah, but I didn't do it for this VM because it's kind of a pain to do. You have to like modify a registry key. Like that's kind of, you know, hidden somewhere. So, um, all right, so I'm trying to overwrite the return address in this uh, SCH overflow application. Let's see, my buffer's at 12FB6C again. It's a lot similar to the one we just we last did. Uh, where's my EVP at? So 12FFC4 minus 158. Okay, so. Thank you. 
Okay, so what should happen here in a perfect world is that I just uh, set it so that I should replace the saved return address with bbbbbb, and we should see eip equals all that. But um, we never get there, and it's because this call, I wrote the, uh, the local variables, and then when they're used again, it generates an exception. And um, oops. and it's just called dead beef. Actually, it's because a dead beef ended up overriding one of the exception handlers. So, if I hadn't overridden one of those exception handlers, then we would never have gained control of the IP because the exception would have just occurred, and then Windows would have uh, done its exception handling process and. Did then just basically killed the process and it displayed an error message. But um, let me pull up this for a second and so I can get all these uh, calculations cleared up. So why don't you guys take like a five minute break while I get all these uh, offsets figured out. All right, so. Um, Board while you were gone. Um, I had you guys rebuild this uh, Visual Studio project. I forgot to turn off some flags or something like that. They're messing me up. So if you go to uh, the project properties and configuration properties, C is plus plus and optimization. Change that to optimization disabled for me. And then go to build and rebuild. Your rebuild failed there. Yeah, I know. I already rebuilt it successfully. It's just failing because um, I have the debugger open, so it can't write to the executable file. So, um, yeah, what was happening before? Yeah, so Sam, we didn't change the code. Just uh, go to Visual Studio and uh, Project Properties and C++ Optimization and turn off the optimization, optimization de disabled and rebuild. So uh, what was happening while well, I had to debug that is uh, for some reason I think I'd forgotten to recompile or I had left optimizations on and was positioning the exception handler before the return address, which was just, you know, it's fine for us because we can still gain control of the IP, but it's making it hard for me to uh, demonstrate my point of why exception handlers are often better than the return address. And this way we're all on the same page. So, um, okay, at this point I've set up my payload, so it should be overriding AAAAA, it should overwrite the saved return address, but when I do that, EIP is never a, it just um, causes exception and it'll never execute my return address because it's crashing because um, this F close ain't gonna work since I've corrupted that point but it's getting past F close. However, what I want you guys to do is um, come here to your byte writer file um, and instead of making this like a calculated value, you know, something nice. We're just going to make it as much data as we can put in. So it's asking for 2048 bytes, the every call is, so that's what we're going to give it, all 2048 bytes. It's going to generate 2048 bytes of dead B. Okay. So if I uh, make it 2048 bytes of dead B and I run it this time, ah, EIP equals dead B, which is exactly what we want. So let's actually uh, step through and see what actually happened. So, once again, I'm going to set my breakpoint on the call to F read and um, look at the stack right before the call to F read happens. Okay, so I'm running in a buffer of 12FB5C. 
see if that's that. Where's my return address? It's at 12FF68. Okay, so 1,036 bytes again. That's all fine and dandy. And then where's my exception chain then? I'm going to use that uh, so we'll look at the real way. See what the tab tells us, Bing tab. It's just referenced by the FS register. Remember that? The FS segmentation register. That's where it's getting that value from. So my exception handler chain starts at 12FFB0. So I'm going to do. I'm telling you that you look at 2D words since I know that the uh, each structure in this exception handler uh, structure is um, 2D words total. The next pointer and the function pointer. So, okay, there's my exception handler. How far away is that from my buffer? Four hundred fifty-four bytes. So, my file that big, big enough. Yeah. So, I'm definitely going to overwrite this exception handler structure. And um, when an exception occurs. So I'm going to use this function pointer right here, but instead it's going to be deadbeat. And when that happens, we'll have EIP equals deadbeat. So let's try to step over the call to read and see what happens. Ah, oh, we never even get there. We never get past the call to read. That's because we're trying to read in so much data, we're overriding past the bounds of the stack, and we're um, generating this exception. If we use bang x chain then we'll see that um, dead beef exists as a function pointer on there. And if we want to look at the exception handler list manually as well, we can do that. So what happened here? What's important is when you, um, a couple things. When you gain control of the EIP, the exception handlers, when you're working on your payloads, you're not going to see EIP equals your data immediately. First, the debugger is going to catch this exception. You're going to see access violation. But um, that's just the debugger letting you know, okay, an exception was just generated. Um, you want to do something here where you can just let the process try to handle it on its own using its exception handler list. So you're just going to type G. When you tell it G, that's going to tell it, okay, well, pass the exception to the application. It'll handle it with its, its, its exception handlers. And when that occurs, you'll get EIP equals your data. So you have to remember to hit G one more time while you're um, getting control of EIP this way. And uh, another sort of interesting thing is that when you call into the Microsoft Core Runtime Library, which is where the crash is actually happening because it's a uh, mem copy that's in the fread call, is in the Microsoft Runtime Core Library or whatever, Core Runtime Library, it's adding another exception handler onto the, um, the list. So we calculated this before. Our exception handler list was started at 12FFB0. And now, according to the tab, it's um, at 12FB18. That's just because the Microsoft uh, Core Runtime Library added another exception handler onto it since it was executing Microsoft code or something like that. They wanted their own Microsoft exception handler registered there in case something bad happens. So one more G and uh, dead beef. So another way we can gain control of EIP, and this is going to be really useful for us when we're uh, trying to bypass all these exploit mitigation technologies. I realize at this point that it's kind of like, you know, beating the dead horse here with gaining control of EIP with the stack overflows, but we need all these tools for day two and day three when we're um, generating crashes and bypassing exploit mitigation. So. There's a reason why we're kind of 
talking about the same topic from five different angles here. So just bear with me. How's class morale? People seem a little bit disheartened. Why are we doing the same crap again? Just remember, these are the tools we need, even though they look very similar, to bypass all these mitigation technologies, which we absolutely have to know how to do because any reasonable target we need be developing an exploit for is going to have some exploit mitigations turned on. So we have to have all these tricks to get around them. It'll all be worth it on Wednesday when you see your friends browse through your website and they have 5,000 calculators appear on their computer, I promise. Does it matter that we're using SEH overflow versus SEH crash? Um, SEH overflow is the process you're exploiting. SEH crash is just the file I was putting my payload into. Oh. So yeah, Sam, that's totally okay. You are going to get an, an access violation with there. Um, and that's because the FREAD is generating an access violation because it's trying to write so much data to the stack that it's writing past the limits of the stack and it's saying, all right, I can't write any more data, so here's an exception. So if your um, exception handler list is pointing at your shell code, though, theoretically, uh, when you hit G again, your shell code should execute. So you can use dot bang x chain. So when that occurs, if you do dot bang x chain, you should see the address of your shell code appear into that output because it's been registered as forcibly registered as a uh, exception handler for any exception exceptions that might arise. All right, so anyone got to the point where they think it should be working, but it is not working? Anyone got it working? Okay. The point where it should be working is when you run the bang.xchain command. When an exception occurs, you see that your shellcode is referenced in the output. And you hit G, if you hit G, that should allow the process to continue and your shell could get executed when the uh, process handler kicks in, the process exception handler gets kicked in, but it's not occurring. It just stays on that same exception saying access violation, access violation, access violation. So um, let me show you guys how I would work through this and what's going to happen. So, All right, if I recall correctly, I was um, overriding the exception handler list at um, like 454, I think it was. So the first four bytes of that exception handler should be the, uh, the next pointer in the linked list, and then the four bytes after that are the function pointer. So presumably this should set EID equal to uh, B, 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 once it runs. Okay, so yeah, that's all good. Yay. It's, so presumably what you would do now is you would insert your shell code in somewhere here. Something like that. And then um so I don't know what the address of my uh, buffer is. Let me look that up. Okay, so the address of my buffer is 12FB5C. So I'm going to, 12FB5C should point at my CC shellcode here. I mean, I would put like a calc here, I'm just going to put CC just here for now. So I'm going to replace that with um, uh, 
5C FP12 uh, and then if I restart I should get like the software breakpoints hitting my debugger but it's not happening ah, why is it not working well there's a reason it's not working actually and that's because these exception handlers were so widely abused by exploits that the Windows exception handler uh, parsing code, the code that actually like um, iterates through this linked list of exception handlers, it has some um, sanity checking heuristics. And one of those heuristics is if the function pointer points at a stack address, disregard, <laughs> not valid. And that's because so many exploit developers were overriding the exception handler list and pointing at the shellcode on the stack. However, notice that when you set it just to AAA or deadbeat, it did end up saying EIP equals deadbeat. So there's like a set of kind of like bizarre heuristics that Microsoft implemented for what's a, a valid exception handler and what is not a valid exception handler. So some of the invalid exception handlers or anything that's on the stack no good, will not go there. But it has this weird catch-all case where the address points to like no process address space and it allows it. Which is why if you set the exception handler to A's or deadbeat or something bogus, it still allows it and sets EIP equal to that. No idea why they did that, but they did. So, okay. We can't point the exception handler directly at our shell code. So what are we going to do? Use the jump ESP trick? Something like that, yeah. So maybe when the exception handler gets called, one of the registers like ESP points at our shellcode, we can use something like jump ESP or jump EAX if that's what's point set or something like that. So let's try to figure out what we can um, jump to or jump through or something like that to accomplish our objectives. So here's how I would go about trying to figure out um, what to do to get our shellcode to execute. First of all, I would search for an OXCC byte, a software breakpoint byte. Yeah, exactly. So Sam, we can overwrite that address, but it won't actually use the function pointer and go to that address because it's saying, nah, I don't think so. That function pointer is pointing to a stack address, so no good, not happening. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to overwrite the uh, function pointer with the address of a software breakpoint byte, just execute OXCC. I'm going to let the debugger trip, and then I'm going to look at the state of the program, the register, to see if anything points at anywhere where we could put our shell code or anything like that. And I want you guys to do this too. So, let's. Um, We just find us a CC byte to use. Maybe I shouldn't do that after. What was that? Oh, maybe not. So let me just make sure this one works for you guys. Copy me. So I'm going to replace this with the address of this um, CC byte, the software breakpoint. So in you guys' file, it offset like a 4, 458, I want you to put that address. And then restart and make sure you can hit this breakpoint in your SDH overflow process. <clears throat> 
And what this is going to do is it will allow us to stop the debugger or use the debugger to stop the process at the immediate point where we would have gained control of EIP. So we can look at what the state of the program is and if there are any like hard and fast things pointing to our shell code so we could do like the jump ESP trick or something like that. Because ESP isn't going to point right at our, uh, our shell code unfortunately so we couldn't do jump ESP or something. We couldn't do that. That's not a problem with this uh, OO or No, we're assuming that um, you know, all bytes are fair game again. So for the, those of you that hit it, I want you to look at the state of the registers and see if any of the registers point to our shell code or anything that we control so we can do something like the jump ESP trick and jump to um, something that we control. Okay, so ECX, you know saying ECX points at EIP, but um, we don't really control the bytes that are at EIP at this point in time. We're just sort of using bytes that are already there. But you're heading in the right direction. Also look at the state of the stack. What is the stack pointing at and what's on the stack? Maybe there's a pointer to our shellcode somewhere on the stack close by. <clears throat> 